I'm Catherine Flynn, editor of the Cambridge Centenary Ulysses. I'm a professor in the English department at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm author of James Joyce and the Matter of Paris and editor of the forthcoming New Joyce Studies. I'm also a native of County Cork in Ireland. This is a big year for Ulysses. It's 100 year anniversary. Um, there have been many successful editions of Ulysses to date, but um, this one appeals to the gamut of readers. It's for lovers of literature who are new to the book. It's for teachers and students of the text. And it's also for readers and scholars returning to Ulysses who want to engage in the evolving discussion around it. Um, this edition features a facsimile of the historic 1922 text in a volume that includes everything the reader needs to deal with this challenging novel. Um, a, managing amount, a manageable amount of footnotes at the bottom of every page, introductory essays by leading Joycians, photographs from the time, maps of the characters' movements, and all kinds of other helpful resources. So let me tell you about some key choices I made in editing this edition. So one of them was to use a facsimile of the famous 1922 Shakespeare and Company text. Um, so this is the first edition of Joyce's book that was produced in 1922. Uh, Joyce notoriously wrote the book up to two days before the, the book was published. Um, and uh, Readers um, have talked a lot about the errors in that text. However, paradoxically, this is a relatively pure edition because it's free of the later errors introduced by attempts to correct Ulysses. So the history of Ulysses since 1922 and the publication history is largely the history of arguments about how to correct it. So this edition um, gives readers the beautiful first edition um, in a lovely font based on the Elsevier family uh, with Joyce's own errata notes in the margins. So Joyce's own identifications of problems in the text, as well as references to the other famous edition, most famous edition of Ulysses, Hans Walter Gabler's 1986 edition with vintage. And so Gabler, went through the text and produced, went through all the manuscripts and produced a new manuscript, a virtual manuscript, one that had largely never been seen published, but was based on Joyce's manuscripts. And so in the footnotes of this edition, the Cambridge Centenary edition, I make reference to Gabler's notes and I include his corrections the interesting and important ones, and also text that he inserted. And so you can see the difference between the two texts. And this, I think, prompts a lot of insights, prompts discussion, and um, allows the reader to get a sense of the history of this uh, complex um, book. The other key decision in producing this volume was to invite 17 other Joycians to write essays about the episodes of Ulysses. And in this, the volume takes part in a tradition that was established in the 1970s by Hart and Heyman, who brought out a book of 18 essays by 18 Joycians on the 18 chapters of Ulysses called Episodes by Joycians. And so this book offers an up-to-date version of that. And in a way that speaks to readers that um, are new to the book. So each essay offers um, a summary of the plot and an account of how Joyce reimagines Homer's Odyssey in Ulysses in each chapter. And then it offers insights, um, asks questions, and also situates that episode with regard to the ones that came before and the ones that follow. So you, the reader, gets a sense of the evolution of the book as a whole. So the Joyce community is huge and vibrant. So it was very difficult to narrow down the list to 17 other contributors. 
all of these scholars have made significant contributions to our understanding of the chapters they write on. Um, or they have, and they have, particular experience of their context. For example, Karen Lawrence offered a groundbreaking reading of Telemachus, the first episode, in her book, The Odyssey of Style. And in her essay in this volume, she helps the reader embark on this Joycean odyssey by introducing him to crucial ideas, such as the initial style, which is the narrative mode Joyce invented, which combines narration with interior monologue or stream of consciousness. And she also helps us enter the book by understanding Stephen Douglas, this um, uh, quiet, intellectual, withdrawn character who's uh, quite challenging for readers to understand. Karen frames him in ways that we can relate to. She writes, when we first meet him, Stephen seems dispossessed, not only by usurpers in the tower, his friends who have taken the place over, but also from his own story. A reluctant character in his own drama, he's less a protagonist than a disgruntled observer of Buck Mulligan's performance. So this shows us a character who is uh, maybe cast against his will in this epic. Another contributor is Terence Killeen, a retired editor for the Irish Times. And he writes about the episode set in the newspaper offices, Aeolus. And he's able to situate the character's eccentricities in the journalistic culture of the time. So he writes, in fact, to anyone who has spent long enough in Irish journalism, the editor's foibles are recognizable, if a bit extreme. He's on the spectrum of eccentric editors, even if rather far out on it. This was and is a very loose world in terms of behaviors tolerated in it, whatever about the attitudes espoused. The legendary eccentricities of journalists are partly a function of journalism's unique position in relation to the mainstream of society. Journalists are of their society, but not quite in it. Their essential function of reporting the facts, the news, means that they at times, they can even be somewhat at odds with their society. Maybe the inherent tension between the sense of a higher calling that one's failing to live up to, instead of serving ideologies and warped politics, induces a feeling of inner turmoil, indeed revulsion that might well lead to the seeking of solace and drink. So this is, I think, an extremely interesting observation about the culture of journalism that only an experienced journalist could make. Um, another essay um, is um, Catherine O'Callaghan's essay on the Sirens episode. So in the Odyssey, uh, Odysseus sails past these uh, magical creatures who lure men to death with their song. And Joyce turns that into Bloom listening to men singing um, lugubrious nationalist songs while he's thinking about Molly's upcoming adultery with Blazes Boylan. So Catherine O'Callaghan is an expert on music in Joyce and a trained musician. And so she is able to write not just about the performance of the men um, and the musical references, but also how musical events uh, effects reverberate throughout the language of the chapter, how it merges word and sound. So let me just um, read you a little paragraph from her. The Sirens episode is riven in two sections. Readers first encounter a sequence of words and phonemes, sound effects which do not obey the rules of cut and dry grammar and go ahead plot. This is Joyce's phrase for standard narrative. The order to begin, this is at a list of fragmentary phrases that start the chapter, is then issued and the episode proper follows in which the initial fragments can be found scattered and embellished. The main body of the episode opens with the sound of iron shod horses hooves, the noise created by the viceregal cavalcade procession of carriages, including the representative of the British Crown in Ireland, Lord Dudley, infiltrates the bar of the Ormond Hotel. This is an indicator of a central aspect of the episode, an exploration of the manner in which sound travels 
and of what can be heard where. So to give you one more example of the range of these essays and of how they speak directly to the reader, even while conveying a deep erudition and knowledge of the text, let me read a passage from Roland Crowley's essay. So Roland Crowley is an expert in the genetics of the text, in Joyce's um, process of composition. But at the beginning of his essay, he returns to his earliest moments with the Circe episode, a strange hallucinatory chapter that takes up the largest part of Ulysses. Why does Virag's head go quack? Midway through Circe, Leopold Bloom's grandfather unscrews his own head and holds it under his arm, like the headless horseman of myth and fairy tale. Unperturbed, the disembodied head emits a single puzzling quack. Even the entrance of Grand Papaki, that's the Hungarian term for granddad, strains credulity. Lepoti Virag, or is it Virag Lepoti? Both names appear in quick succession, shoots down the chimney flue, a Hungarian Jew turned Father Christmas. What are we to make of such material? This edition is designed to help the reader tackle the challenges of Joyce's book, but also to experience its pleasures and to begin or to continue a journey through the text. So the greatest challenge in producing this volume was to bring together so many elements, the individual essays, the facsimile of the first edition, the information in the footnotes, the references to Gabler's insertions and corrections, Joyce's own errata in the margins, the index of recurrent characters. So you have a little description of each character who appears more than once and um, an account of who they're based on in history and then a series of page numbers where they appear. Um, and that's at the back of the book, but where there's also a guide to secondary literature and uh, other material. But the volume also includes photographs, maps, Joyce's own crib notes for the reader, um, what are called the schemata, the schemes that he wrote, um, and a chronology of his life in the context of a contemporaneous cultural and historical events. So managing all of that was difficult, um, but it's come together in a beautiful way in this edition. And I'm really, I'm really happy. Uh, <laughs> I'm really happy with the book. Let me show you um, some pages from it. Here is the beginning of Terence Galeen's essay on Aeolus, the episode that's set in the newspaper office. And uh, Here's an example of the illustrations that um, are found in the book. So this is um, a picture that I found in the Dublin City Library and Archives of Nelson's Pillar, which was bombed in the 1960s. Um, and, uh, um, and then there's also a picture of Newsboys. This is from the National Library of Ireland. So you get a sense of how um, there's space in this book to open it up and um, present different um, uh, different views of the world at, at, of Dublin at that time. So let me skip, oh yeah. And then another crucial thing is these maps. So we'll see here, Bloom doesn't move around that much during this episode, but he does, uh, he does go back and forth a bit, walks along Bachelor's Walk. So you'll see here a key, and um, the locations of the various conversations and references in this episode. And then this um, larger context map that shows you where this is in Dublin as a whole. So let me also show you um, what it looks like. So here we have the first edition with a drop shadow and footnotes below um, so that explain um, succinctly anything that might be um, difficult to understand for the reader. Um, and uh, these also include, um, as I was mentioning, references to, to Gabler's amendments. And we'll see here in the site page numbers um, or line numbers that refer to Gabler's text. So a lot of the secondary literature refers to Gabler's edition, which has line numbers 
And so here, these keys allow you to move between um, the secondary literature and, um, and this book here. I love that Ulysses spans the gamut of thought and experience. It raises central philosophical questions about modernity, but it does so in, a, in ways that relate intimately to the lives of its characters. It's about Dublin as a colony, a colony of Britain, but it's also about um, Dubliners' wit and humour. It captures the idioms of people living in Dublin in 1904, but it also explodes the English language and the novel. I think what I love most about it is how vibrant it is. It's so packed with detail and complexity that it continues to say new things to me and to, I think, everyone as we develop as readers. I can't count how many times I've read Ulysses, but every time I return to it, it offers something new. And each generation of scholars finds something crucial in it that speaks to their time. So Ulysses was banned even before it was published. Sections of the novel were featured in a, a New York modernist magazine called The Little Review, and an excerpt from the Nausicaa episode where Bloom watches a young woman display her underwear to him on Sandy Mount Strand and masturbates. Um, this passage was brought to the attention of the society, the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. And they brought a successful lawsuit against the magazine for obscenity. Subsequently, publishers in the United States and England were afraid of prosecution. And so the book wouldn't have found publication without Sylvia Beach, who had it published in France in 1922 under an imprint named after her Paris bookstore, Shakespeare and Company. So the irony is the finished book features far more obscene moments than that of Bloom looking at Dirty McDowell's drawers. And um, the book breaks all kinds of conventions around the representation of sex in English literature and also around bodily functions. Um, in 1933, there was another uh, landmark case on the book's obscenity, and Judge John Woolsey saw it in his statement as um, a groundbreaking representation of, of experience. He said that it was somewhat emetic, meaning tending to make the reader sick, but nowhere an aphrodisiac. So it was not pornographic. But he said that um, in representing he observed that in representing the thoughts, sensations, and memories of characters, the stream of consciousness achieved an effect like multiple exposure in a cinema film, which led to the novel's difficulty. So this judge, it was clear to this judge um, what an enormous achievement this book was in terms both of innovation, in terms of writing, and also in terms of the attention that it paid to people's lives. And it's because of the density of its representation of 1904, the amount of detail, the richness, the wealth of the physical lives, the, the social context, the historical background, but also the characters' thoughts and feelings and actions that the novel invites us to think again about the possibilities of the world. So both the world of 1904 and our world today. So like many Joyceans, I'll be celebrating Bloomsday in Dublin. Uh, the James Joyce Symposium is being held at Trinity College Dublin and U University College Dublin this year. So it'll be great to see um, all my colleagues and friends in flesh because we've been talking online for the last couple of years. Um, there'll also be a launch of the Cambridge Centenary Edition on Bloomsday at the Museum of Literature Ireland. And I'm really looking forward to talking about it with my, my fellow Joycean, uh, Anne Fogarty, at this wonderful new literary museum that celebrates um, a thriving Irish culture. The main thing that I want readers to take from this edition is that this is a novel that we can all explore together. This sense of community comes across in a podcast that I host 
that's um, related to this volume. So in U22, the centenary Ulysses podcast, I and some former students talk with the contributors to the volume and to readers of Ulysses from around the world. This podcast is about readers' journeys through Ulysses, and this edition is designed to support you on that journey.